again for our message today. The scripture is the gospel according to Luke, 15th chapter, starting with the 11th verse, reading all the way through the rest of the chapter, which is the 32nd verse. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off in a distant country where he squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. He went out and hired himself to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he went, he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For his, this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they begin to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come. He replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry. And refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all the years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and was found. God's word for God's people and God's people said amen. Amen. I must say, not that I get caught up in lots of material things, but when there is an item that I have lost. I may not have cared about it as much or thought about it as much or spent much time dealing with it as much when I knew where it was, but when that item became lost, it all of a sudden became that much more valuable to me, and I began to focus on what was lost until I found it. And the fact that I lost it made me appreciate it a lot more. They say that you don't miss the water until the well runs dry. And so when you care about things that you've lost, you spend a lot more time focusing on them than the things that you already know where they're at. Those family members that you only get to see every now and then, you appreciate getting to see them a lot more sometimes than the family members that you see every day. Scarcity makes you want something even more. I was listening to a radio show uh, yesterday, and uh, they talked about how our brains react as fans of sports teams. And someone brought up the fact that um, when you go to a basketball game or a football game or any other sporting venue, when they bring out what's called the T-shirt cannon and they shoot these free t-shirts into the audience, and people fight over these t-shirts. 
they fight over the t-shirts because it's scarce. If you took that same t-shirt and handed it out to everybody that walked in the building, half of them would be in the trash before the game was over or on the floor, kind of like how we do church bulletins. Uh, But the scarcity of the item makes it that much more valuable. And not only does the scarcity of the item make it valuable, but when you associate a cost with it. So those same T-shirts that they said in these tests and watching how people think about things that are lost and that are found, if you said give the usher a dime and they would pass that same T-shirt out, the people weren't willing to pay for that same T-shirt a dime that they would fight over because they thought nobody else had it. Our perception of what we value is how it controls a lot of our behavior. And so the things that we think we're lost, the things that we think we don't have an opportunity to to gain, the things that we think we don't have an opportunity to get back, rather, we treat a little differently. Some may argue that's why some of us will be in a relationship a little longer than we need to be because we don't think we can find another one like that one. What value we place on things has a hold on our lives. And so here we have in the text a bunch of people that are angry at Jesus. There are Pharisees that are mad because Jesus is hanging out with sinners. Rabbis were not supposed to be associated with people that they thought were unclean. Rabbis wouldn't even be caught teaching somebody that they thought was unclean or did not hold the same moral standards as them, let alone eating with them. But here we have Jesus hanging out with tax collectors and sinners and teaching whomever wants to learn. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear. There are people who won't be associated with these people in Jesus. It's teaching. A matter of fact, in order to be taught by a rabbi, you actually have to get denied three times. You have to ask them to teach them three times, and that's it. They, they, they're testing you to see if you really want it. But here, Jesus is out here saying, he who has an ear, let them hear. If you want to hear what's going on, if you want to learn something, Jesus is willing to teach. Jesus is not making you ask multiple times over and over again. Jesus is not hazing you. Jesus is giving you what you need to know without cost. And he's hanging out with sinners. And we as, I would say, a 21st century church have kind of gotten lax on that term, sinners. We kind of gloss over it. You would find uh, even... Uh, times that some Christians don't even believe there is a such thing as sinners anymore. Some of that milk toast thinking. But when the Bible is talking about sinners, this is not a nice thing. When the Bible is talking about Jesus hanging with tax collectors, this is not a nice thing. Tax collectors back then were like the mafia. See, they had to pay a certain percentage to the people in charge of the area. They said, come give give me my money. And so what they would do is get the money from everybody else and they would charge extra to their own people so that they could keep the difference. They were literally running a racketeering scheme. So when Jesus was hanging out with tax collectors, we look at tax collectors now as those who get us that fat refund. When the W-2s come in, that's not what they're dealing with now. These people were, uh, were, were doing racketeering, a protection scheme, and Jesus went after them. When they said sinners in the Bible, it's not somebody who might have slipped up. This was a bad thing, but it makes it that much more valuable that if Jesus was willing to hang out with somebody that we would think was the scum of the earth, that Jesus is willing to die for somebody that we wouldn't be caught hanging around with Anytime that shows just how much love he has for us. 
And if he can love them like that, he can certainly love us like that. But we've gotten lax on it now. I figured I'd just point that out. We gloss over Jesus hanging with tax collectors and sinners and things of that nature. That's not a good thing. Those aren't these awesome people that might have just messed up one time. These were people who made a career out of doing certain things. But even though they made a career out of doing these bad things, Jesus still went to go get them. Jesus didn't say, I'm not going in that neighborhood. Jesus didn't say, I'm not going to that school. Jesus didn't say, I don't want to deal with that type of person. He got them anyway. And Jesus didn't say, come out from among them. Jesus went and got them. And so the Pharisees are mad. And so he tells a parable first of a lost sheep. Talking about who would have one hundred sheep and if one went away the shepherd wouldn't go get them Jesus went after those things that were lost and then he told the parable of the lost coin right after that and a woman who has ten silver coins and loses one and when she cleans up and finds it rejoices the things that we lost we place value on And so after the Pharisees got mad, he tells the story of the lost sheep, and then he tells the story of the lost coin, and then he goes on to where we got in the text, the story of the lost son. The son has rebellion. Let the church say rebellion. Rebellion. The son seeks his inheritance. He exhibits foolishness by seeking his inheritance. He demands his share of the father's estate. An inheritance is a transfer of property upon death. The son is literally saying to his father, I wish you were dead. Not only is he saying, I wish you were dead, he's trying to cripple the rest of the family. Because see, if you look in Deuteronomy, uh, in terms of inheritance laws, the firstborn son got two thirds of the estate. So he was wanting two-thirds of everything that was left and leaving one-third for them to work on. He was trying to say he wished he was dead, but he was entitled to two-thirds of the property. So he sought his inheritance. And after he sought his inheritance, he squandered his inheritance. The Bible says that he wasted all his money in wild. And, and when you look up the Greek, what they meant is loose or riotous living in some of those translations. He was living big. He wasn't hustled. He didn't invest the money in Enron stock and lose it. He didn't put it in a 401k plan. He lived it up big. Nobody, no, no Bernie Madoff type person came to him with the money and said, I got a great investment plan for you and he lost it. He didn't lose it in a real estate deal. He went big with it. He partied hard with the money. Prodigal son means loose or riotous, unworthy living. And he went big and bad by his own self. And I like that the text is, I like when the text says certain things and I also like when the text is silent. Because the text is silent in a few areas. It doesn't say why he decided to leave home. There's no back and forth or conversation about how he, how he was going to do what or what happened. It doesn't take a thesis or a dissertation. He just black slid. And just like he can decide and do something wrong, we can decide and do something wrong just like that. It can be just as quick as picking up the phone when we don't need to. Just as quick as going someplace we don't need to, talking to somebody we don't need to. So just as bad as this son got out here real bad, we can get out there real bad that quick. So before we start thinking that we are better than anybody else, before we start thinking we got all of our stuff together, all it takes is one bad split decision and we'll be on the same path. Saying yes to somewhere you don't need to be, it does not take much to fall off. We can't look hard at those who fail because, as they say, if we keep on saying good morning, if we keep on living, we might find ourselves in the exact same situation. 
it doesn't take much. So I like that the text doesn't go into his thought process, doesn't talk about everything he did. He made a decision and he acted on the decision and he got the consequences of the decision. That can happen in anywhere. But he squandered his inheritance and then he endured famine. Eventually he desires to eat the food of the unclean. See, I'm not going to go into the, the extreme depths of it, but I'm just going to say that a pig is not the greatest animal. Bacon tastes good. Ham tastes good. But if you were to see how a pig lives, you might change your mind. And because of how a pig operates in terms of not, 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 not stopping when it gets full, eating until it can't eat no more, but if there's still some food there, it'll crawl into the food and, and, and lay into the food so that when it wakes up and it can eat some more, when its stomach is empty, it's going to do it. Uh, they talk about our digestive systems. God made our, the human digestive system so that it curves. And see, that curve and cleans it up and takes the nutrients and all of that things out. A, 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 a pig's digestive system is straight. There's no, there's no cleaning about it. So there, there were things that God said during that time, don't eat the swine. So if it was considered unclean, no self-respecting Hebrew would dare touch a pig. But he was so desperate. He was so hungry that not only was he touching the pig, he was working on feeding the pig. Desperate times call for desperate measures. And it says that he desires the pods. They call them carob pods. Carob pods are a bitter fruit off the carob tree. They have no nutritional value. But pigs will eat anything, and so the people who ran pig farms in order to run these, it was a good food to feed them. But here this brother was that was hungry and broke and working a job that was against his religion, touching things that was unclean, and here he desires something that has no nutritional value. When you are hungry, anything that looks like food you will take. That is why I hurt for some of our youth, because the same thing happens in terms of discipline and family structure. You have your young men that don't get the discipline in the family structure at home, but they get into a gang, and there they find that father figure that they didn't have at home. There they find that support system that they didn't have at home. There they find that structure that they didn't have at home. You have your young women who don't get the love and the affection that they need from home, so they find it in someone else's arms over and over and over again, different people every time. When you are hungry, anything looks like food. You will fill yourself up with stuff that you would never fill yourself up with if you were full. So we have to be mindful of what we feed our people. So he endured a famine and then he decided to return. Let the church say return. Return. He came to a realization. He came to his senses. He understood that he was in a terrible circumstance. He hit what some people in the recovery community call rock bottom. He had gotten as low as he could possibly go, and he came to his senses and decided he wanted to come back home. He had resolve. Number one, he had resolve to return, and number two, he had resolve to repent. In the text right there, it says, I will set, in verse 18, I will set out. And go back to my father, and that's the return. And say to him that I have sinned against heaven and against you. That's the repenting. I am no longer to be worthy. Call your son. Make me like one of your, heart, your servants. Repenting is a psychological term. When you truly repent of a sin, you change the way you think about it. It's more than just saying I'm sorry and hoping that everybody stops talking about it. 
you have to change the way your mind thinks about it. If you still like it the same, then you may not have truly repented. He understood what he had done, and that's why he asked not to be back in his son's status. He would have taken servant status because he had changed his mind about what he thought about everything, and he had resolve. He grew up. The Bible says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, I know in part But then I shall know just as I am known, he grew up in his thinking. We ought to be able to grow up in our thinking. Those things that we think that are okay in the past may not be be the same later on. If you're still thinking about the same things, if you're still doing all of the same things, you're not growing. The son grew. He resolved to return. And then he confessed He didn't come back and hold his head down and wait for the father to come to. He was coming to him. His decision was to go to his father and tell him, I have done wrong. We have to be able to tell the father when we've done wrong. Not just hold our head and hope nobody mentions it. Not, not just wait and not talk about it and keep going and then when it's old, when it's enough time has passed, be like, that's old. It's in the past. Why are we bringing it up? We got to be able to talk to the Father. I got some Bible for that. First John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. When we talk about the Lord's Prayer, forgive our sins, forgive our trespasses. You have to confess them in order to get it out there. I'm not saying you give it to everybody else, but you give it to God. You give it to anybody else, it's going to come back to you. Everybody else is going to know. They say two people can keep a secret if one of them's dead. So you tell your talk, you talk to Jesus, you tell him about your troubles. That's who you confess your sins to. And the son confessed. And because he confessed, he returned and he had a resolve to return. He had a resolve to repent and he got a reunion. The father greeted him with open arms. He doesn't ask where he's been in the text. He doesn't ask him what he's done. That's a perfect opportunity for him to say, I told you so. How was that living? What was it like being grown? Not as easy as you thought, huh? Hey, where that money at that you asked for? You should be be rich by now, right? He had a perfect opportunity to give it there. He could have had him working as well. He could have had him work back and repay the debt, but he didn't. The father saw fit to put him right back in the status that he left. Perfect opportunity to say, I told you so. But not only does he not say, I told you so, He runs to his son. Something that's overlooked in that part of the text is, is it's actually undignified during that time period for a man to run. But he ran to his son. Parenting will make you do some undignified things. But it's that love that a parent has for his child that will allow them to sacrifice and work ends, work end to end to make ends meet. When you are when you are struggling for your children and trying to go on, it's not that hard anymore. It'll make you do some undignified things. And that is exactly what this father did for the son. The father didn't care where he had been, and he also didn't care what anybody else thought about him. As long as he had the love of the father, he could do whatever. Didn't matter about his past. Didn't matter about where he'd been. Didn't matter about what he'd done. He had the love of his father, and the father had the love of his son. So there was a reunion. And then after the reunion, there was rejoicing. Let the church say rejoicing. The father plans a big celebration for the occasion. The father has received the younger son, 
the, the father received the younger son and, and put this celebration on for him. He put a ring and a coat on him as well. In those things, when I was doing some of the studying for this, this, this message, I've learned that even though during those customs you had the land and the cattle and everything else, a father was never allowed to sell his ring or his coat. No matter what happened, you can have the land. You can have the animals, you can have the servants, you can have the whole business, but never the ring or the coat so that that man would not be entirely destitute. But here he is in rejoicing, giving up his last. The first thing he tells him is put a ring on him and put a coat on him. So even when he thought he had depleted everything, there was still some more to give. And that's out of love. And so there's rejoicing. God rejoices when a sinner repents. That's what Jesus was getting at when he was telling the parable of the sheep and the coin and the son is that God rejoices when a sinner repents. But amongst the rejoicing, we have resentment. Let the church say resentment. The son is furious. The younger son, I mean, the, yeah, the younger son is furious about the older son getting his inheritance. And then he's furious about him leaving and then coming back. And he's furious about this whole separation because he's been working all this time. He's been in the church, I mean, the family this entire time. And here this new person comes getting this position. He's mad about this new member, I mean, this returning son coming in. And so he has a problem with that. Unfortunately, that's why a lot of churches don't grow. Because they force the new members out done some studying as well and working in some church plants and one thing that I've learned was troubling is they say that every church actually has a capacity to double every year almost. Why? Because they have first time visitors that come in throughout the year and just by being able to cultivate those first time visitors into coming back you would be able to grow your church substantially but the problem is that the first time visitors come in and they see this click and they say, I don't know where I fit in in this clique. It might only be one or two families in the church total. And they force them out. Not intentionally, but you got a bunch of people who have been into each other the entire time instead of looking at what's out. But then you also have some that are intentional. I had a colleague, not in this state, but in Alabama, but when she was pastoring the church, they had members that would sit at the door, put their chair in front of the door when all of the established members came in. Why? Because they were blocking anybody else from coming into the church. They liked the church the way it was and did not want to see any more. The Bible tells us to go out and make disciples amongst the nation and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We can't do that if we always are staying in here. We have to be prepared for them to come in and treat them right when they come in. But yet this son is furious, doesn't want to be around the party, doesn't want to celebrate, and he's mad. And so the father comes out and talks to him. And I like that because the father actually did not owe him an explanation. He didn't owe him anything. But that's that love. That's that trying to get that understanding. That's that trying to help these people grow as much as they possibly can. That's a father still raising his son. And he explains to him that he had everything he had from the beginning. And something that I did not notice about this text when I first uh, prepared for the message 
or I mean, I've heard the story more, more, than a, more than a few times, but something that was completely missed right here back in verse 12. It says, the younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. <clears throat> the son said to his father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. The son said to his father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. The other son had his share of the inheritance but worked and slaved away like he didn't. I am reminded of that with the church. The older brother viewed when he says that he worked, his, when he says he slaved away and he served, the statement indicates that the older brother viewed his relationship with the father as reward for labor. But the father was loving response. He had everything he already need. He just did not use it. The father showed love. He showed grace. Salvation is not a reward for good works. Salvation is not a reward for good works. We can't do anything to earn it. We are but yet filthy rags. The Bible says by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. It is a gift we have, and not only do we have that gift, we already have our inheritance. We just don't understand it. Ah, the Bible says that we are blessed and not cursed. We are the lender and not the borrower. We are the head and not the tail. We are supposed to be blessed in our coming and our going. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of the man what God has for you. For I know the thoughts that I have for you, a plan for a hope, and a plan for a future. You have a blessing already. It's all over the Bible. We can't get mad at a prosperity preacher because they're reading this Bible. We got grace. We got faith. We have salvation already. We just don't know it. And here we took it. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, the doors of the church are open and we invite you to come.